do that, we do that. Okay, and we do that. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to, for those who are coming online now, uh, at live stream and Ustream, thank you. God bless you. Glad to have you here. Uh, and I want to thank those who have been following us on SHR Media and also uh, High Plains Pundit Media live this particular morning. I want you to understand that, unfortunately, many of us have done unjustly to those that we have been required in our meekness to inherit, to those who are in great need of salvation. Because what we have done is that we have created a profession in this that may not necessarily be wholly scriptural, that the only way that people can be saved is if they come to a church. Let me just tell you right now. I'm going to give the secret away. When people read a mystery novel, murder mystery, whatever, uh, the butler did it, all of a sudden people are upset because you gave it away. I'm going to give it away right here. You my friend, you, my friend, are salt. You are the salt of the earth. And what you're going to discover today is that God intended you to use your saltiness, no matter where you are, to preserve the earth until he returns. And then judgment. Mind you, let's go to where we're going to start today. I want to go to Bartleby for just a moment. You all know that we use the Blue Letter Bible, B-L-U-E-L-E-T-T-E-R-B-I-B-L-E -E -E, uh, dot org. And uh, you know that we also use the Etymology Dictionary. Uh, but today we're going to use an extra biblical uh, pursuit so that you might understand how powerful you really are. Uh, we're going to Bartleby. We put it over in the chat roll at the Broadcast Central. You'll be able to click on. Uh, and it is a writing of Booker T. Washington around 1901, in fact. And it is in regards to the Reconstruction period. And I want you to pay attention to what Booker T. Washington says about ministry. He writes... Naturally, most of our people who received some little education became teachers or preachers. While among these two classes, there were many capable, earnest, godly men and women, still a large proportion took up teaching or preaching as an easy way to make a living. I want you to pay attention to this. Because this is what we have done, and we need to ask forgiveness of it. Put that right on in the chat roll there. What Booker T. Washington said. Many became teachers who could do little more than write their names. I remember there came into our neighborhood one of this class who was in search of a school to teach. And the question arose while he was there as to shape of the earth and how he would teach the children concerning this subject. Now, I want you to understand the context he's putting this in. In Deuteronomy, we are told that we should be speaking to our children on the scriptures in the morning, at noonday, in the afternoon, and at night. The scope of this is that you are shaping not only the minds of the children on a daily basis, but you are shaping the earth. And you are teaching the children. Suffer the children to come unto me. Remember that scripture. This is what Booker T. Washington is saying. There is a shaping that's happening. He said he explained his position in the matter by saying that he was prepared to teach that the earth was either flat around, according to the preference of a majority of his patrons. I want you to understand this now. The teacher came to town and stated, I have a way you wish 
me to teach, I'll be satisfied. It's not a righteousness to teach your children that which is right. It is righteousness to teach your children your preferences. He goes on to write, the ministry was the profession that suffered most and still suffers, though this is 1901, though there has been great improvement on account of not only ignorant, but in many cases, immoral men who claim that they were called to preach. In the earlier days of freedom, almost every colored man who learned to read would receive a call. This is it's right here. A call to preach. In the earlier days of freedom, almost every man colored man that they, uh, forgive me, every colored man who learned to read would receive a call to preach within a few days after he was reading. Wow. The call to preach. Pay attention, people. In the earlier days of freedom, almost every colored man who learned to read would receive a call to preach within a few days after he began reading. At my home in West Virginia, in the process of being called to the ministry was a very interesting one. Usually the call came when the individual, pay attention, was sitting in church. Without warning, the one call would fall upon the floor as if struck by a bullet and would lie there for hours, speechless and motionless. Then the news would spread all through the neighborhood that this individual had received a call. If he were inclined to resist the summons, he would fall or be made to fall a second or third time. And then he always yielded to the call. While I wanted an education badly, I confess that in my youth that I had a fear that when I had learned to read and write well, I would receive one of these calls. But for some reason, my call never came. Thank God, Booker T. Thank God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you to Scripture real quick. And we're going to learn something today that many of our beloved fall at the wayside waiting for someone to come to them and preach to them and teach them the scriptures and I'm talking about from the one-year-old baby who's learning how to da 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 ba 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 ma 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 to the 101 year old who has lived a long time has seen a lot of things and just wants to know if they believed in vain. I want to take you to Matthew 28 real quick. Matthew 28. So that you understand that you don't have to wait for a call. You've already been called. You don't have to wait for a call. You've already been called. Matthew 28, I want to take you to verse 18. In fact, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 put those scriptures right out there in the chat roll so everybody knows exactly what we are talking about this morning. We are allowing millions, if not billions of people to die, never knowing Christ Jesus. It is our will to get beyond four walls and to get beyond the crux that we carry in our hands holding us up thinking that if we are not rightly trained by men then we could never preach the gospel ladies and gentlemen you're going to learn a whole lot today uh looking at matthew 28 verse 16 then the 11 disciples went away into galilee into a mountain where jesus had appointed them wow I, I want to, because we sometimes skip over this. Iesus had appointed them. Some people are looking for that great ordination in the sky. Let's go to Strong's G. 
fifty twenty one. Strong's G fifty twenty one. And I hope that you all are listening today and getting this. This is what must be done that all men might be free. Strong's G five thousand twenty one. Toss up. Toss up. Tasso means to put in order, to station, to appoint, ordain, or order, to appoint, ordain, or order. So the number one thing is that Jesus has ordered you. Jesus has ordered you. That's what Taso means put in order to station the disciples and we've been talking about the mount the sermon on the mount jesus's manifesto you'll see this in a few minutes where he put in order and in fact there is a mutual agreement of that particular order you'll see in just a few but God puts in order exactly how he wants his composition. So, number one, to put in order. Who has done this? Who has put you in order? Order my steps. Oh, we love to sing that song, don't we? Order my steps. Oh, mm, mm, I feel church up here. God saying, get out of that mindset. God says, I put you in a station place your body is the living temple i've put myself in you that you may go forth and i have appointed you with a responsibility and i have also given you authority an authority that yale can't give you that harvard can't give you that howard can't give you that dallas theological can't give you that atlantic theological can't an authority that supersedes the authority of men. And then he says, and we'll see this with Simon Peter, that the appointment is mutually agreed upon. When you have accepted me as Christ, I have accepted you as my messenger. You don't need robes swaddling around you with great manifestations of ornation. Jesus is saying to you, go forth. How do I know this? Well, let's take a look at what the scriptures say. Matthew 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. First and foremost, there is a in essence, a requirement of seeing him. Oh, okay, oh, kid, kid, no, I've never seen Jesus. I'm not talking about a perception with your senses. I'm talking about a perception with your spirit. How do I perceive him? I know him by his word. His word assures me. His word heals me. His word redeems me. His word qualifies me. It is in and of his word. When I pay attention to his word. Strong's G, 1492. I do. I do. I do. He even says it with an I. I do. When I read his word, I see his face. Because God is not a liar. When I see his word, when I hear his word, I'm able to perceive, to know of anything. It is the honor of kings to search a matter out. What am I but a king and a priest? In fact, this is your definition of perceived idol in the context that's given this morning. And I know some of you all did not want to tune in this particular morning because now you're going to leave out knowing that you have a responsibility. 
period. It doesn't come with an ordination. It's to know how to be skilled in. Let us go now in scripture. Since we know that we have been ordained and appointed before any other generations before Jesus. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. Strong's G, 4352. Proskuneo. 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 They worshipped him. So the question here is, how can you worship him if you don't do that which you are appointed to do? It is to kiss the hand in reverence. You, you know, that everyone loves, uh, all the guys love the Godfather because at the wedding people would come and they would kiss his ring and ask for a gifting from him, uh, often not to be murdered. But then you have the Pope who wears a ring and people prostrate before him and they kiss his ring. Uh, showing reverence towards him. Literally, literally, that is the worship that you should have for Christ. But some of us lay down our lives in reverence to a man rather than God. Worship begins with you kissing the ring of Jesus it is bowing in his presence and saying, you are king of kings. You are Lord of lords. You are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Without you, no me. And without me, I know you. There is respect. There is supplication. There is honor. And then finally, as we take a look here, I want you to understand, and, and some of us have a very distinct misunderstanding of the disciples. We picture 11 men having gone through the great loss of Jesus Christ and how bountiful and powerful. The, and this particular hour, when Matthew 28 is written, these men are frightened frightened they are concerned for their lives they have for three years been around Jesus and now there is a wavering there is a wavering and some of us do it too because we instead of focusing on the word of God and learning his word and sitting at his feet and understanding that his word taught to you is just as good as the word taught by T.D. James. His word taught to you. And then we're going to get into why sometimes it's covered, colored in a fashion which is not good for you. But despite the fact that the creator of the universe stepped out and came to you and said, I knew you in your mother's womb. I want you to go speak for me. And it doesn't matter whether it is to one or one million. I want you to go speak for me. Somehow we mentally waver in our opinion that God's talking to us. That somehow if I'm not a graduate with a PhD or a DM, DMN, Demon, <laughs> you all should be very frightened when colleges want to give you a demon, <laughs> doctor of ministry. I, you're wavering in your opinion that he's who he is and you are the appointed one of him. I want to read to you very quickly. And then we'll return back to this particular study. But
I want you to, to no, I'm going to put this in here for those who are following along at home. And, and you feel that you're under obligation to get a doctorate degree in order to preach on Sunday mornings in pulpits. And I always ask people, what college did Jesus graduate from? And it's always, oh, well. I want you to understand that when you go to a seminary you are learning the theology of men how they study God if you were to go to Howard University School of Divinity there is a core coursework of study uh, one of which is con ministry and contextualization ministry and contextualization. It's an interdisciplinary approach to the study of the various settings of ministry and the task of ministry appropriate to those settings. Uh, it introduces students to critical reflection of the nature of ministry in the contemporary world. You see, it acquaints students with those basic skills necessary for performing, performing liturgical, educational, and administrative tasks in the local church. It explores the nature of ministry as part of the phenomenon of religious experience while introducing students to basic concepts in the study of world religions and philosophy of religion. Nurtures an integrated approach to ministry which prepares students to think, prepares students to think, prepares students to think. Our education should never tell us what to think it should tell us how to think and act holistically it demonstrates the centrality of ministry as a unifying principle which provides coherence to the theological curriculum then there is faith development and spiritual formation yeah yeah so you have to take a class about spiritual formation no, no, not Beyonce's formation, spiritual formation. You see, spanning the full three-year program introduces students to the study of the resources for and the practice of spiritual discipline, examines a variety of methods by which people of faith have strengthened and depended, deepened their faith commitment. Working in small groups with a faculty advisor, each student explores the rich tradition of spiritual exercises, including prayer. Oh, wow. I'm actually going to go pay someone $10,000 a year to teach me how to pray. Does not the scripture do that? Bible study. I'm going to pay you $10,000 a year to teach me how to do Bible study. When I take you every Sunday morning to Blue Letter Bible and we do our own Bible study, and I don't see the loss of it. And meditation. In order to develop a program which best suits his or her individual needs and spiritual personality, personal growth nurtured in a collegial setting as a model for continuing practice in professional ministry. Then we get into the society, culture, and religion. The sociology of religion. Examination of the sociological traditions of Max Weber, Emil Dukin, and later contributors to the uh, sociological understanding of religious phenomena, such as Dewey, Mead, Cooley, and Watt. World religions. Psychology of religion. Introduction to the study of religion. Introduction to African religions, African religions and diaspora, history of Islam in Africa, contemporary Christianity in Africa, contemporary issues in African um, Afro American Islam. So, if I'm teaching you about Islam, am I teaching you that they are the equivalent, or am I teaching you so that you might be able to go out into the world and talk with those who are actually practicing Islam? and by your evangelistic efforts are able to turn away from the cult. 
oh, well, Clutch the Pearls, uh, Elijah Muhammad, Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, which, if you would ask most people who make it to Mecca, would not consider them Islamic. Um, then there's studies in ministry. Pastoral care, religious education in the church year, preaching and practicum. Preaching from both the New and Old Testament. African-American prophetic preaching. Wow, I need that. <laughs> to teach you about the migration, the great migration. Now, I'm looking at all of these particular classes, and you can do this on your particular own accord. But is this really having anything to do with the salvation of the soul? The caring of the body of Christ or is this about teaching you how to think and how to preach that you can be like the preachers in the day of Booker T Washington who were paid to teach you that the world is either flat or round depending on how much you paid them. It's a love story like no other. From God's heart to yours. And for 30 years, it's been at the heart of every book, Bible, CD, gift, and resource from ChristianBook.com. Over 500,000 products, always at the very best value. ChristianBook.com. Everything Christian. Because it's our story, too. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back to an American Conservative's exploration of the inspired Word of God. I am your host, the exceptional one, Kim McClinton. We're studying it today to find out who is qualified to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that you are learning that you are qualified to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't require a theology degree. And in fact, I must tell you that sometimes I believe a theology degree gets in the way of you actually doing what the Holy Spirit has been calling you, calling you to do. We took a look at Howard University School of Divinity and some of its classes that are required in order you, for you to graduate. And I suppose in terms of knowing that, knowing Islam will make you a better preacher. I suppose knowing women's studies will make you a better preacher. And these are some of the quotes from individuals who are studying. Uh, for a degree in ministry, a doctorate in ministry. I want y'all to pay attention today. I know some people are going to say, Ken, how dare you? you? You can't say those kinds of things. I'm going to tell you that if I don't say them, a lot of people won't get saved. Uh, Adam Walker Cleveland wrote uh, this back in 2007. He said, after three quick, he, referring to a Dr. Pastor. Uh, so many people want to be called Dr. Pastor. Uh, here's a quote from the article. He says, after three quick, easy, study light years, the pastor has attained his doctor ministry degree, his doctorate degree. That degree gives the pastor a tremendous amount of respect now. I'm respected in the community. The mayor has to address me as doctor. I digress. That degree gives the pastor a tremendous amount of respect now. He is Dr. Pastor now, a real somebody. More importantly, there is tremendous upside attached to his new title, and the ceiling on his earning potential has just been lifted. Dr. Pastor has clout now, uh, or Dr. Reverend Pastor, if you will, suffice it to say. He has respect, money, and position. Now, there are many people who are Dr. Pastor now who can't claim either respect money or position but many people have made it a requirement of doctorate in order for you to preach the gospel not Holy Ghost filled now there was a young lad 
and, and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, young lady Bridget wrote, I remember the pastor of the church I served in seminary telling me not to get uh, a, de de a demon, uh, but to go for a PhD. His reasoning, you're smart and you can finish a PhD. Number two, you can't use a demon uh, for much other than a title in church work or a placement. Interestingly, he had a demon. Wow. And I suppose a lot of people in education do, but I want to go to the comments of a young person who put the mindset in the right place after receiving so many of these uh, particular writings. Uh, Daryl says, which of these degrees comes complete with a higher calling from the Holy Spirit? Oh, almost forgot. We don't have much need for a calling when we can just judge by titles. We should be careful how much world we let into the ministry. No degree will ever determine how much the Spirit chooses to work through a person. I hope some people have already said in their spirit, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, on the chicken circuit, the doctorate works very well. It will get you into places and with people that you would normally not have the opportunity to address. But so does the Holy Spirit open up the avenues and doors for the poor to speak to the rich and for the student to speak to the teacher and for the rule to speak to the ruler. Secular education is not a requirement to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, well, Ken, that's nice and that's wonderful, but it, where does it say in the Bible that you have the authority to preach the gospel? Well, let's first take a look at the term preach. Uh, because many of us have confused what preaching really is. Uh, from the Latin pray, which means to go before, and dacare, to proclaim and to say. Preaching is merely going before people and saying what God told you to say. Well, how would I know God told me to say it? Well, guess what? It's in the scriptures. And when you look at the etymology dictionary, you will see preach being a verb and that its responsibility is upon us to proclaim the things of God in season and out of season but I don't belong to a big church and, and, and nobody tapped me on my shoulder and told me that they could feel the spirit in me guess what the spirit sealed you when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that does not mean that you go out willy-nilly saying whatever you want in your own opinion. It is the fact that now I can proclaim what is in his word to the world. Not my interpretation, but what is in the word itself. I want to also let you know what it means to be a preacher. What does it mean to be a preacher? Literally, literally, it means to be a public praiser, a eulogist, a public praiser or a eulogist. Well, I bet you're not going to learn that this morning uh, from someone who is getting paid well to tell you that you can't save souls, you can't teach them, you must bring them here and we will clean the fish. Remember that word salt? We're going to find out what Jesus meant in just a few about salt. And I may not be able to get to everything uh, today like I normally do. Not get to everything, but I want to give you a good point. Matthew chapter 28. And we've been looking at 16, 17, and 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven 
and an earth. In heaven and an earth. So you don't have to look around for someone to say, Woo! You have been filled with the Spirit. Now you go preach. You don't have to wait for that. For the Spirit is always within you. Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And watch what he does with that power. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye for he gave it to you. The same power given to him, he gave to you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. That was his last commandment to you. Not just the acceptance that you have eternal life, but his last commandment for you, whether you are the 68-year-old lady who sits there on Sunday morning and rocks back and forth in your chair listening to this Bible study and thinking, well, I got mine. Or that you are the young lad in your 30s and you don't want to offend too many people with your Jesus thinking you'll keep that on the down low or you are the teenage girl who is sitting in the classroom right now listening to this feeling very upset and guilty that you have not spoke to your spoken with your friend to tell them about Jesus or whether you are a little boy who's five years old who has heard the Word of God and knows that it is true your job is not to teach an opinion but to teach the truth the truth comes from what his word whenever you have the opportunity right no Jesus says go he says go make an opportunity make it happen so Ken we looked at Matthew 28 I get your drift but I haven't studied systematic theology. I haven't studied eschatology, which is the study of the end times. I haven't studied ecclesiology, which is the study of the church, which the church in the Greek would be the called out ones. I haven't studied Angelo Logi, uh, the study of angels, or angelology, however way you wish to say it. The study of angels. I haven't studied hermetiology, the study of sin. I haven't studied theological anthropology, the study of the nature of humanity. I haven't studied soteriology, the study of salvation. I haven't studied pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. I haven't studied Christology, which is the study of Christ. I haven't studied biblical theology, the study of the Bible. I haven't studied theology proper, the study of the character of God. You know what's missing in systematic theology? Pneumology. Not numerology, although that is a study unto itself, but nomeology, the study of the names of God. Hmm. If we're going to study something, the study of the names of God might take you for about two years of biblical studies in and of itself, in a context of the power of God himself. But because I haven't studied all that and I don't have a degree up on the wall, I can't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a lie from the pit of hell. So, Ken, you were talking about salt. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to take you to verse 13 verse 13. I know it's a lot of notes today. I know it's a lot of notes today. Uh, and I can't promise you that from now on there won't be. But I want y'all just to relax. Matthew 5, 13. I'm going to take you there real quick as we have come off the ramp a little bit and we want to see exactly what God is saying to us not only at 30,000 feet but also at ground level. The scriptures read, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Uh, it is this for good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Please circle that. Please highlight that. I, I want you to 
highlight salt because we're about to go back and see the first reference and context of what we're talking about here salt go back to chapter 4 of Matthew Matthew chapter 4 And at, at, at the off ramp, we're getting refilled here. This is what, this is, we're refilling ourselves. And I know some of you would say, hey, kid, would you just talk last week about the I am statements? I thought we wanted to do that. We were, we're going to get to them. We're going to get to them. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And thank you all so much for watching via Ustream and live stream. Pass it on to your friends and family. There is so much here. I can't get to it all. But that's the great promise of God. The more you know him, the more and more you need to know him. Matthew 4, 16 reads, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers they were fishers some of y'all saying to yourself okay yeah we get that point Kim we, we know that uh, Peter was a fisherman and so was his brother but I want to take you to the term fishers to the term fishers and I want you to take a look at Strong's G 231 Strong's G 231 Hollyus Hollyus now it refers to fishermen or fisher fishermen or fisher don't you want to be a fisherman? Don't we all want to be a fisherman? I know some of you all think of Peter, and, and you, and this is one of the dramatics of preaching. You have individuals that will sit back and preach that it's a cursor and a swear, and he was salty and fiery, short-tempered, ah! piratical, I guess. He was already a fisher. Jesus would later say, I will make you fishers of men. I want to take you to the root word for Halios. Strong's G 231, Halios. Halios. It is actually Strong's G. 251 strong g 251 when you read this scripture now let me just go ahead and get that out strong's g 251 house house first lexicon second entry house house in either case it means salt it means salt want to go down real quick so that you get this into context he said in Matthew 419 I will make you fishers of men he said and he saith unto them follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you salt. Wait a minute. Jesus is saying to sailors that he's going to make them sailors. He's going to make he's going to make them salt of the earth, fishers of men, salt of the earth. Your role in scripture is to preach the good news to all 
It doesn't matter if you have a pulpit or not. You are to walk with Jesus. And in that journey, preach the gospel. So that you might become the salt of men. How men will be preserved is by your salt. Let's go on and read. Matthew chapter 4, 20. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. I want y'all to understand what the name uh, Simon means. And I don't know the, the stories that you've been given. Oh, he doesn't listen. He's hard-headed. Oh. Things people have said about me. Uh, Simon comes from the Hebrew H8095. In fact, let me just go there right now and show you in terms of Simon. And then, actually, let me go to G80 first. Let me go to G80 first, which is Adelphos. Strong's G80 Adelphos. Adelphos. Okay. Now, I want you to understand, one of the most powerful things here is the scripture that's being read. Jesus chose from his brethren. Now, a lot of people would say, well, they weren't related to him, so cross that off, that he weren't related. They had the same national ancestor, belonging to the same people or countrymen. Jesus was a Jew. He chose a Jews. He chose the Jews to walk with him. But those Jews who were brethren in Abraham would soon become brethren in Christ. Brothers by blood. Metaphorically, they were brothers of blood as a Christian at the cross Jesus made them brothers by blood his blood so I just wanted to make that clear to you so you know right there and we'll put that in there when Jesus was picking he picked from the few and that's where the Adelphus comes from. And then, go back here. We look at Simon. And Simon comes from G4613. Strong's G4613, Simon. 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 Well, Guess what? That's not the root. The original Hebrew goes all the way back to this. Strong's H, 8085. Shaman. Shaman. And second entry, Shamea. Shamea. It goes to Shamea. Do you understand what Shamea means? Let me break that out for you. So that we can begin to see Peter for who he was in Christ. Not defiled by our preaching, but in truth. Peter was someone who heard, listened, and obeyed. Peter, as Simon, was someone who heard, listened, and obeyed we are same shame we are those who listen upon hearing and obey who do we obey we obey christ what did they do immediately when he said follow me they put down their nets and they followed him now at, let me just go to Matthew 4 real quick. These are the disciples he has with him. Matthew 4.20. 
and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Matthew 4.21. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. They heard, they listened, they obeyed. Matthew 4, 23, 24, and 25. Here we go. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. In Matthew 4.25, and they followed him great multitudes of people <clears throat> from Galilee. You know what Galilee is? Galilee, forgive me, uh, basically means a movement that begins and ends in the same place. These are people that just spend their life going around in circles. Going around in circles. That's where the people of Galilee were. Decapolis. They were a large group of warriors or strivers. They were from the ten cities. Romanesque, Palestinianesque. These were individuals who were always starting something. So that was part of the multitude that followed Jesus. And then Jerusalem set ye double peace. These were his own who followed him in curiosity wondering if he were the Messiah. Judea, he shall be praised. These were those who recognized him as the Messiah. Out of Judea. And then those from Jordan. These were descendants. Descendants of the Jews. Who had been waiting to be brought into the family. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand. When we go to Matthew 5 right here in closing. Matthew 5, 1. Go to that very quickly. Quickly, quickly, quickly. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Notice who he sits beside, in front of him. His disciples. There's an order. And then after them were the people. All those people that I just talked about, who had issues, problems, concerns, striving, had been having religiosity all their lives. They sat at his feet. And he gave them the manifesto. He gave them the doctrine of God and made it clear for them to understand. And so in this particular instance, Jesus says, Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the fishers of the earth. Ye, and I have given you power, and authority to go do as I say do. Teach them that they might know me. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back next week in American Conservative's exploration of the inspired word of God. Yours truly, the exceptional one, Kim McClinton. God bless you and remember John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever, whomsoever, whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. So what do you think about ebooks? Maybe you've never read an ebook before, but you're considering giving it a try. Or maybe you've been reluctant to try ebooks because you don't want to buy another expensive electronic device. Or maybe you already enjoy ebooks, but you haven't been able to find titles from your favorite Christian authors. Whatever your situation, ChristianBook.com has the solution. 
a trusted source for print books for over 30 years, now offers ebooks. Our always free CBD reader allows you to read on the devices you already own without spending money on a new device. Thousands of Christian ebooks at ChristianBook.com means you can shop with confidence and choose from the titles you want. Plus, we are adding new titles all the time. Browse our huge selection of low-priced Christian ebooks the same way you would printed books. Only now you can go from shopping to reading in seconds. Simply select the ebook you wish to purchase, confirm your account information, and start reading. Free samples of every ebook are available, so you can preview the book first before you buy it. Plus, there's no lengthy app downloads and updates. Accessing the CBD Reader is as easy as going to cbdreader.christianbook.com and bookmarking the page. The CBD Reader holds your ebooks and bookmarks for you, no matter what device you're on. So, you can take your entire ebook library wherever you go and pick up right where you left off. Our customizable options make it possible to read your ebooks in different font sizes and styles. Want a large print version? You've got it in seconds with a simple click of the mouse. Already own a dedicated e reader? Download your ebooks to your computer from your ChristianBook.com account and transfer them to your device. Try ebooks at ChristianBook.com and start reading your favorite books in seconds. Easy, economical, Everywhere you want to read, welcome to ChristianBook.com ebooks.